Welcome to the virtual lecture. Um, so what I would like to talk about in this virtual lecture to give you a little bit of a taste of uh, how lecture and, and uh, lecturing could look like at KLU is to talk about the topic of how algorithms change life and business. Um, uh, clearly, um, it's, a, it's a digital format now, but I think um, we, we, we can give you a very nice taste of what we typically do and what we discuss and how we uh, do lecturing at KLU. So um, let me start right away with the, the, the question, so to address the elephant in the room, so to say. So what is an algorithm? And um, maybe you think that's a very trivial question, um, but in fact, to many people, this question is not easy to answer. So just to make sure we're all on the same page, let me answer a question for you. So, um, and the, the answer here is, um, uh, yeah, uh, is something very tangible, hopefully. Um, so what you see here is basically uh, the eight steps. And if you follow these eight steps, you, um, if you execute this algorithm properly, you uh, hopefully end up with the cookies you can see at the bottom. Yeah, so what you see here is nothing else but eight specific instruction that if you follow these instructions in this particular order, you end up uh, with a result. And in this case, it's uh, it's cookies. And, and while I use this example, it's of course clear to you that uh, when we talk about algorithms, we typically talk about algorithms in a computer setting and a computer cannot bake for you not yet, uh, at least. Um, but the, the, I think the basic idea is hopefully clear, right? So what computers do is they follow a couple of steps to deliver something to you. Um, and before I get into uh, all kinds of different examples, I would like to ask you, so just now you have a very basic idea of what an algorithm is. So um, where do you, um, oh, no, I'm, I'm not yet there. So um, why I'm talking about this, um, I think what I wanted to point out a bit of as an anecdote before I get back to you is um, what people in Germany know and think about algorithms. Um, so I trust that uh, you have a feeling, but if you ask people uh, in Germany, um, and I cannot make any claims how representative is, this is for uh, the world's population, but if you ask Germans, okay, what is an algorithm? Then 45% say, well, I, I don't know. I, I cannot say anything about this term. 46% um, are not sure whether this is actually something good or bad. Um, and then we'll get there. This is a very surprising thing because our life is quite dominated by algorithms. And 73% um, actually have a clear opinion that although they do not really know, uh, what an algorithm is and whether it's good or bad, they have the feeling, okay, I don't want algorithms to make any decisions independently without human intervention, which I think is quite interesting. 30% um, believe that, still believe that software can make better or fairer decisions than humans. Um, so I think that kind of matches the 73% where people are quite um, critical. So um, you see that the topic of algorithms is um, something that is still not clear to many. Um, and now I wanted to um, ask you, and you can simply put some thoughts in, in the chat, uh, no need for, uh, for Menti, um, to, to, to just share, wh wh where do you think is your life um, affected um, by algorithms? So I see uh, everything, which is, I think, a, a very precise and correct answer. Social media, yeah, very good. So let me maybe just lay out a couple of uh, a couple online shopping. I see. Um, let's let me exp let me give you a bit of a feeling um, because I think you uh, you're perfectly right. Um, so. My message is, of course, that algorithms are everywhere. 
Um, so if you search something on the internet, you're going to use a search engine. And it might be Google, it might be something else, but of course what you search is not the internet, but what you search is a database uh, and there are algorithms. Whether you find something or not is to some extent up to an algorithm. If the algorithm doesn't find it for you and that contradicts maybe a bit of our feeling, if I can't find it on the internet, it doesn't exist. Uh, to some extent that might be true, but if the algorithm for some reason doesn't show it to you, you won't find it. Yeah, so you you fully trust an algorithm to work properly here. Um, another example: content selection, right? So if you go, if you use social media, the things you see are, are largely uh, influenced by what you have been looking at in the past. I think that's something you have noticed, obviously. Um, so if you're interested in cats, then you're going to see a lot of cats. If you're interested in uh, beaches, then Instagram or Facebook, then so they try to understand, okay, what are the things that you like? And they will select content for you, um, which can be good and uh, which can be bad, um, depending on, on, yeah, if you have a certain bias, then uh, social media might actually um, make this worse because you only see what you already believe in anyways. Yeah, um, Netflix, um, Amazon, uh, Spotify, all these platforms help us by giving recommendations. If you buy something on, on Amazon, Amazon, uh, you, you have seen it before, right? So customers who bought also like. Yeah, that's uh, something we have all seen. If you watch Netflix, then Netflix, of course, shows you, okay, if you watch this, then you're probably gonna like that. Uh, Spotify, it's the same thing. If you create a playlist, then uh, Spotify, of course, knows how to extend this playlist. Um, so what, what's behind there are so-called recommendation algorithms. Um, and at some point, we trust that, right? So we we actually stick, or not stick to the recommendations, but what we see is is really influenced by by these pre-selections because some content is never presented to us some products are never presented to us even though we might be interested in anyways matching so things go very far you see where i'm going so if you um go an online dating platform um of course you're not going to be presented or matched with any random person but you enter some uh hobbies interests and well then there will be people uh humans <laughs> presented to you you might uh want to meet or not um so even whether you find a partner or not depends on uh, depends on algorithms uh, at least in the online setting um and if you happen to be lucky and you found a partner online uh and you you end up uh, with a desire to build a house then uh, you may need uh, you may need some money from the bank and it again uh, depend on algorithms and this is by the way one of the examples that uh, reaches back very far so already many 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 years ago uh, credit scoring was a thing so whether you get a loan or not a mortgage or not is uh, depending on an algorithm yeah um, last example um, and also uh, in more, yeah, even more important situations. So if you um, get sick, for instance, um, algorithms can help. Um, some algorithms are even better than humans. So um, there are some advancements, for instance, in the diagnosis or the detection of cancer cells. So there are machine learning algorithms that are better if you present an image, um, scan, to an algorithm, they will be able to detect cancer cells that a human wouldn't be able to detect. Just to uh, give you a bit of an idea of the spectrum of where algorithms affect our lives today. And now if you think back, how many people don't really know what an algorithm is and why this is good or bad, I think this is very surprising because this is uh, largely affecting our lives. Okay. Um, what my what my message is besides that i mean now you hopefully believe that algorithms are important is we're at a business school of course we're also talking we want to educate you um for your career and algorithms also change business and that's something that is very important to understand and it, the, the big um topic that is driving this is of course the desire for improving and not only after or during a crisis the desire to improve processes and operations is omnipresent and many organizations always want to 
make things better. Um, and algorithms simply play an increasingly important role in that, in that context. Yeah, so I've lived in the Netherlands for four years um, and I, um, well, if you live in the Netherlands, you, if you want to fly somewhere, you fly KLM, um, not because I'm making any, uh, I don't want to advertise KLM, but just as an example, and I've had a lot of interactions with them and I think they're a very nice uh, use case because you can see clearly uh, how algorithms are changing and affecting business. That, that example is probably very obvious, right? So if you go online, you want to book a flight, then um, there's ticket price. And if you look today or look tomorrow, uh, the price might be different. Even during a day, if you look in the morning or in the evening, uh, the, pri the price might differ, not because there's a person that has entered a different price in the meantime, but this is completely automatically determined by algorithms that forecast demand and try to um, offer you the price you're hopefully booking. And that can be good and it can be bad, depending on um, how this algorithm assesses your willingness to pay. Uh, route planning, of course, for airlines is very important, right? So where do airlines fly? Um, I mean, it's clear that right now this is uh, maybe not the most appealing example, but hopefully they will fly to places again at some point. And then again, the question is, where should they fly, right? And it's even a question right now. Uh, so route planning and, and kind of anticipating where um, demand is needed. So uh, a colleague uh, of mine actually told me that he was flying to Chicago a couple uh, days ago, he had to. Uh, and he told me that he was on the plane across the Atlantic with six other people. Uh, and now the question is, why did they do that? Um, not because Lufthansa doesn't know how business works. Of course, they realized that uh, the demand for the way back is very high and would need to plane to bring all the people back. And not, as, not exactly to Europe, but uh, maybe also to India. So if you want to fly to India from the US, you often have to go to Europe. Yeah, so route planning. Um, and the example why I, I actually chose KLM uh, is because of their customer service approach, which I find very interesting. So um, what KLM does um, is they t tell you, okay, don't call us, uh, send us a message. Send your message via WhatsApp, send it on Facebook, send it on Twitter, uh, send it using Facebook chat. Why do they do that? Well, they've realized that many people ask very simple questions. So many people ask, okay, when is my flight? Was it canceled? So let's, let's pretend pre-COVID flights were canceled as well for other reasons. So, but people have very simple questions and they realized, okay, we can actually handle a lot of these questions automatically, but we have to prevent the people from calling. If they send us a text message, we have an algorithm in place that detects, ah, okay, this person doesn't know where to go, or this person has just a request to change the seat. Uh, that's something we can recognize and process automatically. So what KLM claims, I cannot check whether this is correct, but I find this story interesting, is that they, that they claim is that they can handle up to 50% of all the customer requests they get, they can handle fully automatically which obviously frees a lot of capacity for people that have real problems or complicated problems that cannot be handled. So um, this is a big, big cost saver for them. Again, um, our life, so now even algorithms help us with our, with our problems. Um, just looking at the time a little bit, um, but I think before we get into a more detailed topic, I would like to know um, from you, so what do you think? Um, after this very brief presentation, you hopefully have changed your mind already a bit. Um, do you think, what do you think, how important algorithms will be and data will be for your uh, career? I don't know if this slide is um, working for Menti right now is active. Ah, okay. So what we can do is we can just either use the chat, but I think yeah, please please use the chat. I think that's a KLM example. I know that. I will count the yeses and the noes. Hopefully there are no noes. Mm -hmm. I will just okay. Feel free to use the chat.
so I see some I see some yeses. Of course, that's what that's uh, what I what I hope for. Well, I'm 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 of course not. Um, I'm partially here to to convince you, um, but I think the examples really show that um, that algorithms are everywhere, and that it's not so for you. It might not so not be so important to be the one who develops these solutions. That's not why you're coming to kill you. But uh, what we believe is, of course, that you need to understand and, and think in these directions, right? So that the, the idea that, then, that an algorithm could actually handle these things has not been made in the IT department. Yeah, this has been made on a much higher and strategic level. So um, I think it's, uh, so this is a very, I think this is a very important background education. Okay, um, then I will um, continue. Um, I think I don't have too much time, but I still want to give you some glimpse into the topic of um, process mining. So let me start a bit with the context again. So what we have seen now is, um, um, what we have seen now is that algorithms play an important role and even in business. So um, the, the, the problem what many organizations still struggle with, and I'm talking about large corporations, not giving away any names, uh, are they, they say, okay, um, we have a lot of data. Uh, we, want to make, we want to make our operations better. We want to get better. We want to deliver things faster. We want to do things better. Um, and we have a lot of data um, about our processes, about our customers, um, about all kinds of details, um, but they don't know what to do with the data. Uh, so this is a very, very, very common problem that the, that the use of the data is actually quite bad. Yeah, so we uh, also, as a, as a scientist, I get approached by organizations that tell me, yeah, we have, we have uh, trucks and we have equipped these trucks five years ago with sensors. And now for five years, we have collected sensor data from location, temperature, can you tell us what we can do with that? Well, that's a very good question. After five years, you have been investing that technology and actually using it. Yeah. So this, um, but this is not uncommon um, because uh, in the beginning there is the belief just collecting data brings value, but of course collecting the data does not bring value. And what I want to introduce, uh, at least very briefly today, is the idea of process mining. Where, uh, which is, I think, a very nice example of how algorithms can really help to understand how, uh, how an organization works and how uh, algorithms can actually help to make an organization better. Um, so let me explain very briefly what process mining is. Um, by the way, if you're following the tech uh, startup scene, so process mining is also an area where a lot of startups work. And, and Germany has uh, one of the biggest and most successful process mining startups. Uh, Salon is now valued at over 1 billion euros. So this is just to um, put this into context, this is not a niche technology I'm talking about here, but it's still very, uh, very new. So, so let me explain what it is. So the starting point are organizational processes, right? So if we are an organization, we do all kinds of things. If we are a car producer, we produce cars. If we are a hospital, and in many countries, uh, hospitals are basically run like businesses, we deliver medical services. If we are a call center, we provide customer service. Yeah, so it can be at different levels, and there are processes in place. What is a process? A process is nothing else but a number of steps that are executed in a certain order, and then um, deliver a result, right? So if you produce a car, it's clear what you have to do, we have to somehow produce the parts and assemble them. It's not that easy, obviously, but that's what it is. If, if you have um, contact with a customer service center, then there, there's a number of predefined steps. They try to understand what your problem is. They try to find a solution, get back to you, may escalate the problem if they can find a solution. So these are processes. And my story now is that all these processes or many of these processes are supported by software systems. And um, these software systems do not only help us, but they also track to some extent what we're doing, um, which hopefully doesn't give you a bad feeling, but that's 
just how it is. If you use uh, SAP and you order something, then obviously this is tracked somewhere. This is recorded. Uh, and this is called, called an event log. Yes, something happens, it's recorded. And the idea is now, okay, if we have processes and these processes are supported by software systems and these software systems essentially record what's happening in these processes, why can't we just automatically discover what's happening? And what you see at the left bottom, uh, left bottom corner is a process model. Don't be confused by the looks technical. It's nothing else but a visual representation of the process that's happening here. So the idea is that if these systems support our processes and these systems record what's happening, then we can automatically infer what's happening in our organization by analyzing these logs. And they, these logs contain a lot of data. Um, and the idea is let's just hit a button and understand how the process is currently running. So that's the idea of discovery. The idea of uh, conformance is then, okay, if we know how our processes are, how the, our people really work, can we, uh, and we have some idea how they should work, yeah, so that's a setting you often have. They're legal. Um, there are, of course, certain regulations, um, laws, especially in the medical context. You cannot simply, um, so we are, for instance, also working, I'm working with a the hospital. Uh, they cannot simply prescribe you a drug just because you show up and say, I have back pain. Yeah, so there are some, some regulations that they first seriously have to check what's going on, try a couple of alternatives so that you cannot just drop by and, and get very strong opioids. Yeah? So that's uh, a conformance checking issue. So we want to compare what's happening with yeah, how we want things to happen. That's what we call conformance checking. And uh, the last thing we can do is, of course, we can also use information from this log uh, to infer whether things are fast enough. Yeah, so performance means how long does it take to execute certain things? So um, if, um, so for instance, a pr private example, um, one of my flights got canceled because of COVID. Um, I asked for a voucher, I think six weeks ago, I still haven't received it. So now the question is, is waiting for a digital voucher that I received by email six weeks is this appropriate? I would say not so much, um, but this is something that you can see in such a, from such an analysis that on average, the customer waited for six, eight, 10 weeks for a refund might not, might not make the customer really happy. All right, um, so what I wanted to uh, show, and I will do this very uh, briefly, um, is to show you a bit the intuition be behind process discovery. And, and, and let me do this very briefly. So what you see here are three cases. What are three cases? When I execute a process, each execution is a so-called case, right? So if I go on Amazon and order a book, this is a different case than when you go on Amazon and order a book. Yeah, two different cases, two different books. Um, so what you see here are different executions uh, or execution traces, so-called. Right, so here you see for okay, the order is received, then they check whether a stock is available. Obviously it was not available, so they sent a rejection or kept the case. Um, the other two are more positive, but you see there are some differences. So the order is received and uh, availability is checked. And in here, in this case, they're sent a confirmation. And after that, the invoice, and here uh, order goods are sent before the invoice, but in the end, the, the case is archived. And what process mining now would do, and this is oversimplified, obviously, to uh, make this suitable for this presentation, is, okay, let's analyze these traces and try to understand the patterns. And obviously, a pattern we see is that all of these traces start with the receive order, and that all of these traces end with archive case. So that's already something we can put down here, right? So this is a specific notation, you see these boxes represent the activities of our process, and, and this is the start, and this is the end. So we see it always starts with receive order, always ends with archive. Now the question is what happens in the middle, right? So if we look at the rest, uh, the idea of process mining and of the algorithm behind is to analyze the relations. And the idea is if I, um, if I observe that activity A is always followed by B, but never the other way around, 
then I have a pattern like this, right? So if, if I always observe that A comes first and then we observe B um, and there is no instance where it's the other way around, I can safely assume that A must be executed before B. So that's the idea. Um, so in contrast, if I observe that sometimes A is followed by B and then by C, and sometimes I observe, okay, first A and then C and then B, so it's swapped, well then obviously the order doesn't matter between B and C, right? So if it's sometimes like this, sometimes like that, and this is how you would uh, represent this, yeah? So, so this plus means that the order uh, doesn't matter, it's a parallel execution, um, and this is how you would represent this. And the last example, uh, the last pattern is, okay, if I sometimes observe A is followed by B and sometimes by C, but when it, if it's followed by B, it's, then C doesn't, is not, uh, doesn't occur anymore. And the other case, if C occurs, B doesn't occur anymore. So then it looks like we have found an alternative, right? So that's what we call a choice, um, designated by this cross here. Um, and if we now apply these patterns, to the example I've just used, we can fill the gap here in the middle. Yeah, so we see that receive order is always followed by check stock. Okay, let's add this. We can see that, um, um, oops, yeah. Check stock availability and send rejection. Yeah, so sometimes it's followed by send rejection, sometimes it's followed by send confirmation, but never both. So we here we have an alternative. I'm clicking, but oh, so now I was already jumping too far. Uh, anyways, let me just continue there. So right, we just found our alternative, and the last thing we have to we wanted to find is this pattern, right? So we have the send confirmation, and sometimes the invoice is sent first, and then the goods, and sometimes in this case we only have two examples. It's the other way around. So here the order doesn't matter. So what I wanted to show you um, is just um, that by following these steps, and this is something that you can do manually like we did now, but of course you can also just do this. Uh, you can just tell an algorithm to do that. And if you now imagine that there are thousands, ten thousands of that, such traces, this is a very um, useful thing, right? So we just take data that comes from systems, um, execution data, and we click a button, and then we can look at the visual representation of our process, can analyze the process, can understand what's happening, um, and then hopefully also uh, come to the conclusion where we could improve things and where we can make things better. So I will uh, I jump over this. So I also wanted to make the point, of course, that we can, uh, once we have such a model, we can check whether a trace is actually in line with the model. So in this case, you will see that um, most of the things are fine, but that this trace uh, has a couple of violations. So it contains both a confirmation and a rejection, which is not possible according to the model. And what you also see that this trace is missing the archive case activity, and um, just to give you some idea, because I mentioned performance mining, if you project the information, the data from the log on these cases, you can, for instance, see how long the different executions take. And uh, that, of course, gives very valuable input for uh, further analyses. So um, I know this was a very, very quick uh, introduction to process mining. Uh, still, the reality is much more complex um, uh, so, so this is a picture you typically get uh, when you run a real life event log. And what we do, uh, what I do in my course is of course we use tools. So uh, state of the art tools so that you can also conduct a case study that I show you, okay, how does it work when I get a real log? Uh, how do I get if I see this um, to some insights? So we're not only talking about the theory, but also really to uh, show you how you can use such technology to actually get to decisions, to actually um, ba basically figure out how to uh, make an organization work better. Yeah, so this is just one of the examples and one of the things, but I think it's very interesting, also relates a lot to my own research. So this is why I selected this topic for today.